enjoying a fruitful and productive ninth Pan-Commonwealth Forum. My name's Josie Fraser. I'm Deputy Vice-Chancellor at the Open University. I've really enjoyed this week so far and I'm looking forward to today tremendously. I'm proud to work at the Open University where we have such a myriad of student journeys. They're a constant source of inspiration. And we also have some of the most amazing honorary graduates who uh, support us and it gives me great pleasure to be introducing our keynote speaker this morning, who is one of those honorary graduates. Sarah Brown is a passionate advocate for global education and health issues, and her work brings together the worlds of business, philanthropy, social media, and charity campaigning. Sarah is an Open University honorary graduate, which was awarded for public service. She is chair of children's charity, Their World, and Executive Chair of the Global Business Coalition for Education. Sarah's contribution to worldwide efforts to save and change the lives of women and children has been widely recognized. She holds honorary fellowships from the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health, as well as a recognition award from the International Federation of Gynecology and Obstetrics. In the course of her work on women's health, she has addressed the World Health Organization's Annual Assembly and the International Confederation of Midwives. And Sarah chaired a United Nations special meeting that heralded the end of healthcare user fees for pregnant women in 16 countries. Her deep commitment to the health of pregnant women and newborns led to her founding Their World, the international children's charity, in 2002, and Their World administers the Jennifer Brown Research Fund, established in memory of Sarah and Gordon's first child. And in the past 15 years, it has grown to reach across the UK and out globally, providing first funding for innovative health research, community health, and education projects. In September 2014, Their World launched Up For School, a global movement that organized a petition of 10 million signatures to enforce the right of every child to go to school without danger or discrimination. And this led to a successful campaign to support funding for education in emergencies. Their world led the way in the innovation for Syrian refugee children to have a double shift schooling system in neighboring countries. That alone has enabled hundreds of thousands of refugee children to attend school. Their World currently works with global communications group Omnicom on the UN Common Ground Initiative for SDG4, the Education for All goal that has been our focus for this week's conference. And Their World is also steering the new Right the Wrong hashtag campaign. As Executive Chair of the Global Business Coalition for Education, Sarah steers its 150 plus companies from across the world, bringing the voice of the business community together to accelerate progress in delivering quality education for all the world's children. She was managing director of one of Britain's most dynamic independent communications companies and subsequently led a global arts PR firm. As a passionate advocate of women's leadership, Sarah's corporate involvement has continued as patron of the Business Industry's First Women Awards, which honour women in the boardroom and at the helm of Britain's most successful startups and growing businesses. I can also highly recommend her best-selling book, Behind the Black Door, a personal memoir of life at 10 Downing Street. Well worth a read. She's a patron of Maggie's Cancer Caring Centres and the Shine Education Trust, a member of the Advisory Council of the Asia Society Centre for Global Education and a global champion of the White Ribbon Alliance for Safe Motherhood. Sarah also serves on the global board of UNICEF Executive Director's Young People's Agenda. She spent part of her early life in Tanzania in East Africa before going to school in London and studying psychology at Bristol University. 
Sarah lives in London and Scotland with her husband, the United Nations Special Envoy for Global Education, and former Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, Gordon Brown, and their two sons, John and Fraser. Sarah pioneered using social media in government and is an avid user of Twitter, regularly tweeting to over one million followers. I genuinely don't know how she does it all, so please join me in welcoming this inspirational Wonder Woman, Sarah Brown. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you for your uh, long and, and very warm introduction. I'll tell you how I do it all. I do it imperfectly. Um, and this is the reason I'm a little bit late, because the, the most important thing that I do is I'm the mum to John and Fraser, and I had to get them off to school this morning and then face some Edinburgh traffic. So, yeah, always imperfectly, I think. M maybe all of us do that, but especially me. Um, I'm really, really delighted to be able to be here today. When I was invited to come, I was uh, very honoured a few years ago to receive a degree from the Open University, and I've always wanted to be able to find ways that I can you know, give back to them and support them. But I was particularly pleased to come and speak at this Pan Commonwealth Forum and to know with 61 countries represented here in the room that the messages around education are going far and wide. Um, and I'm uh, interested to hear what you've been learning over the last couple of days um, and where you're going to be taking forward um, some of the discussions that you've been having. So I hope with my time here this morning that I can just share some of the efforts being made around education um, in, in pursuit of that United Nations Sustainable Development Goal number four, to provide education for all. What's really uh, momentous about it, this conference taking place this year in Edinburgh, and it's a won wonderful city to be able to, to come and visit, is it's also the 50th anniversary of the Open University, and I know you'll have been hearing a bit about that, but that, that time for celebration of pioneering the widest access to uh, higher education is something that we're very proud of in Britain, to know that the Open University started here because it reaches so many students around the world. And, and students who have come to their education because they're also juggling their jobs or looking after families or managing um, disabilities and uh, being able to include people who've been uh, delayed being able to achieve higher education, veterans and others whose careers have taken a different route first. So the Open University embraces everybody and in that spirit of never losing the opportunity to be able to come and learn, I think it's important when we think of some of the most marginalised communities around the world and how we can include them. I was looking at your themes for this forum and the overall theme of looking at the innovations around quality education and lifelong learning. And I want to try and reference some of the innovations uh, that, are, that are coming through um, the international system today. And then your sub-themes where you've particularly um, identified looking at equity and inclusion. And I think if we're to have any chance at all of fulfilling that goal of education for all, we have to work that bit harder to think of innovative ways to include those children and young people who are otherwise included. Um, and that focus on girls and your focus on, on youth today. So I'd like, as I'm speaking, to be able to address all of those issues. All of this is, needs to be done as we face those challenges of globalisation. And in each of your countries, you'll know what that means for your country. You'll understand that we're all sharing um, a future where we feel the perils that our planet is facing and understanding that we need to change our way of living and of working and of producing to be able to address that. And our growing knowledge and our use of technologies innovations need to be harnessed to be able to, ca to capture that. And again, it roots us back around to education. When uh, in the introduction, uh, you may have noticed that in, in um, the, the, my past work and, and um, activities, that much of it was focused around health. And my um, background was very much around infant and child health. But I've come to realize over the time, I'm not a doctor, I don't have that professional expertise, but I'd always worked in the area of, of global health and public health. But what I've realized through that time, through the time of being in government, through the time of working um, with, it, with international NGOs, is that education is now the, that barrier that for too many children and young people around the world is holding them back. And that if we want, uh, I and mean, it goes without saying that a, you know, a healthy population is always one that, that receives education, and that those who are learning are always ones that are healthy. The two are so intertwined. But 
nonetheless, we've seen huge investments in global health. You know, we have Bill Gates and Warren Buffett and the impact that that's made. We've seen the big investments into some of the communicable diseases around HIV AIDS uh, with malaria and the great strides there. But when we actually want to take a step back and look at how we make those next um, uh, progressions, those next improvements, how we actually reach that, you know, the dream of eradicating polio doesn't happen unless we can reach every child, and yet a few keep slipping out so that we can never quite get to that point. If you look at it, it's the children who aren't in school. You can't reach them and you can't find them. So I've come to realize that the greatest contribution we can make to uh, the goals of whether we're trying to address, you know, the issues with the planet, whether it's, you know, climate change, we want to look at the big gaps around equality and wealth and skills, or we want to look at the health of, of people around the planet, that education is offering a solution to all of those things. And the thoughtfulness we're going to need to bring to this challenge, where we're looking at children who are caught in poverty, or children who are displaced, or they're squeezed by the rapid change in our world, we have a deep responsibility to ourselves and to them. To, uh, to find a way to offer an education to them. So the numbers we're talking about effectively is around 260 million children who are missing out entirely. And it goes without saying that girls and the most marginalized, those who are on the receiving end of discrimination, are the ones that are carrying a disproportionately high um, amount of that cost. And it's interesting with girls, it's not the case that girls don't get a chance to go to school, but it certainly is the case that girls don't get to stay in school for as long as boys do, they don't get the opportunities offered to them. So there's a lot of work we do need to do through the education system to, offer, to, to create gender equality there. You know, girls who are learning are the ones who grow out to be leaders and we need more of those. And girls who are learning and at school and flourishing are able to contribute to their families and their communities and their countries. And leaving them out of the equation is a mistake that I don't think that the planet can afford to make any longer. And your focus on youth, I think, is so important. You know, over 60% of the Commonwealth population is under the age of 30. I'm sure it's a figure that's been resonating through this conference over the last couple of days. But if we don't look at what we're offering as a combination of school education and the relevant skills for the future to young people, to women, and young women and men, then we're facing terrible <laughs> risks to everyone's future. And addressing this challenge is going to need to come from government and business and academia and civil society working together. We need to address the political will and the financing, and that's something I want to talk a little bit more about today. But we also need to be looking at how we address who and where and when we deliver education. So the tech innovations that are coming through, I think we know that many of them won't succeed, but we're trying different things in classrooms, different things for uh, uh, mobile education, different things for children who are replaced. Um, everywhere I go and visit a project, I see a new tablet or a new uh, connection for something. But actually, it's that testing and, and, and trying it out that I think will lead us to something. And one of the things we do at Their World, as well as the top level campaigns, is try out pilot projects so that we can see First of all, what works is effective, where you can get the feedback on the learning. And then secondly, where you've got something working, how you can drive the cost down. Because if we're going to be realistic about getting things out to millions of children, then we've got to come up with quite low-cost solutions. For, for us at Their World, what we do is we're working on pilots, and where something does start to succeed, that's where we connect in uh, with the bigger NGOs, with the UNICEFs, with the UNHCRs, but also direct, directly with governments. And uh, one of the examples that, um, mentioned in, in the, my introduction was the notion of double shift schools. And the double shift schools proposal was a very simple one that came out of you know, an event like this where people discussing and looking at ideas. And uh, a couple of people had seen the example in South America of double shift schools where there was overcrowding in the cities. And it was as simple as that. And we thought, let's take that idea across to Lebanon at that time where Syrian refugees were just pouring across the border, established a good conversation with the government who thought they would try it. And all double shift schools is, uh, for those that don't know, is where you're faced with a large population coming in. You, you need to accommodate a lot of children very quickly, but you're overwhelmed by wh where you would teach them, who would teach them, where it would happen. 
taking an existing school building and shifting it so that you run two shifts in it where one group of children are able to come in a bit earlier in the day and study in the first half of the day and as those leave a second group in and that way you're not having to invest again in the infrastructure to uh, uh, build the school buildings and you're able to share the resources that you have and that's now become the mainstream system for delivering education while Lebanon's hosting that large population. It's moved across to Jordan, it's moved across to Turkey, um, and is, is um, and now um, on the Greek mainland to be able to accommodate those refugees. And it's a, a system that's worked well. It also means that if you think it's a temporary uh, solution, then obviously you can re re revert back if you're hosting populations. And I know, you know many, many of your countries will be under pressure from hosting populations of people that you want to extend the hand of friendship to, but, but it takes a lot to, uh, to be able to do so. So those innovations that we're trying, um, some of them with technology, some of them just with you know organizational and systems work. The systems work is, some, is, is the kind of least glamorous side of it, but some of that and, and the, the leadership that's shown in working out how to run those systems can produce some of the greatest outcomes. It's a huge topic to take on board though. Um, I wanted to um, just unpack a little bit today and think about uh, what I could talk to you about, recognising that a number of your ministers work with ministries, work directly in education, working on the front line. And to think about, if you take a big number like 260 million, if you're, taking, uh, if you're looking at this high percentage across the Commonwealth of young people, that that's a very overwhelming task. And the current trends show us that by 2030, this deadline that we're committed to with the um, United Nations goal to provide inclusive and equitable education at early childhood, primary, secondary levels, and higher education, all of that faces such a huge task. So the current trends by 2030 would say that the 260 million we're faced with now, if we don't change what we're doing, we'll have more than 400 million children leaving school without a basic primary education. And half of the, world's, of the developing world's boys and girls will not have the basic, school need, basic skills needed for the workforce. And that will total about 800 million young people. So if you look at that, we were leaving half of the upcoming youth generation behind. It's not fair but it doesn't make sense for the half that do have either. Even if developing countries double the amount they spend on education and use the funding more effectively by improving their performance to the levels of the top quartile of best performing countries, there are still huge external financing gaps. So reaching 90 billion, which is what it would take by 2030, just feels a very unachievable goal. And we will fall short of reaching that if we use traditional means of financing. And so the innovations that we're talking about, I don't think are just innovations that come in the classroom. I don't think they're just innovations that come in the, the way we look and deliver. But I also think those innovations have to come into the financing of education in order to be able to have um, the opportunity to reach. I think collectively we've got the will to be able to deliver the systems and work out how to do it but I think that um, goal is unreachable unless we're working out how we're going to unlock literally billions of dollars. So thinking of the way the international uh, education system um, is structured and where that financing com come from, you'll all be aware of the Global Partnership for Education which is, uh, was set up by the World Bank which funds education for the low income countries and GPE's work has been invaluable in providing grants for low-income countries where those who are caught in the deepest poverty need support. And their work expresses the best of our humanity. And their replenishment in Senegal just over a year ago showed that the funding for them continues successfully and the need for their important work can go on. But if you look at what GPE are paying out, it's somewhere between about 350 million 400 million a year, it's a large sum, it's a significant organization, but it's not getting us to the billions that are needed. Additionally, just a few years ago, they created a new opportunity. Um, some of you may not be aware, but about um, over, well, going back about five years, it wasn't possible at all in the international system to fund education in a humanitarian crisis. So, which sounds a bit odd to think about it when we think of how many p 
people are displaced or on the move and, and the goal of that challenge. But the humanitarian system was set up to address short-term challenges. It was refugees who were on the, on the move, where there was a natural disaster, where there was conflict, where you had populations that suddenly need to be supported. So the notion of a refugee camp was something that was very temporary. And the emergency work that would go in with the uh, you know, International Rescue, with the Red Cross, with other remarkable organizations would be very much led around providing safety and shelter and nutrition, water sanitation, and then looking at emergency medical care. And the idea was, at the end of that period where things were settled, you'd look at where people would go back to or where, how they would uh, you know, go forward to a new life, but very much a, a temporary thing. Our world has changed so much. The average time that a refugee is a refugee, now, if you, just, if you lump them all together, which is, uh, clearly is a ridiculous thing to do, but if you lump them all together and just divide the average time that a refugee is a refugee is now 17 years, one seven. So t when you think about the life of a child maybe born um, to a mother um, there, that could be their whole childhood until adulthood on average. And the average always means that for some it's longer. So therefore you're looking at a different problem. So that humanitarian issue suddenly became one of not just feeding a child but you know, and their body, but also being able to nurture their mind. And so the education uh, issue came to the fore. And uh, the, the solution in the end was to create a funding system because of the way it had been set up, that even if a um, country came forward and said, I'd like to support education in emergencies, there just was nothing in the system that allowed for that. But in 2015, after a lot of civil society campaigning, a lot of uh, pressuring of governments, whenever you start with a new idea, the answer is always no, it can't happen, no, 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 the things <laughs> work the way they are. But also no, the other no was no, we're already, this system's already overburdened. There already isn't enough funding to fund every crisis and you can't have money for education if it's gonna take it away from nutrition or from health. That was the fear, it's turned out not to be one that was well grounded. N now it turns out that the funding that comes for education seems to come from different channels. So the, 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 the anxieties that were there when it was first proposed to be able to fund education in emergencies uh, um, are much more settled. But of course, you know, as ever, no crisis is fully funded. Um, it's a constant battle to, to get it, and, and education is in that mix. Um, and this is important, because I'll go back to the, the innovations for financing in a moment on that. But the solution in 2015 was that the World Humanitarian Summit that was hosted in Istanbul then was the creation of a new fund. And this is called the Education Cannot Wait Fund. It's hosted currently at UNICEF, um, which was something that was set up temporarily, but so far it's been working very well, so no one's minded to, to shake that up or change it. And Education Cannot Wait in that time has reached the same size that the Global Partnership for Education is. So you now have two significant funding bodies now, one able to fund education in a development setting, the other able to fund education in a humanitarian and cri a crisis setting and able to move very quickly to do so. And interestingly, looking at the funding of Education Cannot Wait, where they've moved in, in many parts of the world, they've been in, um, you know, obviously in DRC, in Chad, in with the Rohingyas, they've been funding um, the m great mix of refugees coming in uh, to the Aegean Islands. They're, you know, they're in lots of parts of the world, they're in Venezuela, they um, have been able to also use, export that double shift school system idea so that populations are able to temporarily accommodate large influxes and be able to move. So we're seeing some of these ideas that have been through the system start to come together and work together. But still, I know you people are all very good at maths, that is not enough <laughs> to get every child to school. Um, and so over the last few years, there's been a very concerted effort, particularly with the emphasis on the sustainable development goals, where each one of those goals has got huge champions working in that area um, and the opportunity at the UN to be able to cross over with each other and to be able to work with each other. The Education Commission was a grouping that came together two, three years ago to really put in some detailed and thoughtful work around how to raise the, the, the supportive political will but also the financing. And the Learning Generation Report um, was published uh, just over a year ago that, ma that mapped that out. And that's been a really landmark document um, that has 
uh, not just set out what those problems are, looking at what the um, current trends are, looking at you know where it moves, but also coming up with those recommendations. And any of those, any of you that have a particular interest, can obviously go and look up that report and get more. But I'd like to single out today the recommendation around the large-scale financing. And the reason why I'm choosing to do that with you here today is partly because you'll all go back to your countries and look at whether you can be a participant in that, whether it's relevant for your country, whether it's something you, your country should be contributing to. Um, I think it's something that will become the, the biggest and most significant financing force for education for children who are, who are currently missing out or will be missing out in the future. So the recommendation has been to build an, a new international financing facility for education. Clearly work needs to be done on the name to make it a little snappier, um, and I've no doubt that will come. But in the, what it isn't, I suppose, is the easy thing would have been to call it a global fund for education. But as is ever the case in the international world that, um, and in, in the international institutions, nothing can ever be entirely simple. And also, to be fair, there are two other funds that exist. There is a Global Partnership for Education and there is Education Cannot Wait Fund. So it, it labours under this cumbersome title of the International Financing Facility for Education, or IFID, as it occasionally gets called. And it's built on a principle that's probably not a million miles away from the way Gavi was built, or IFIN, as the vaccinations funds, where you're starting to use different innovative ways of financing to, to invest in today's problem, but is also an investment into your future. And because education is not just a cost, but a massive investment, you're able to bring that innovative thinking to it. The focus of IFID is on uh, creating uh, a $10 billion fund in the first instance. Um, again, the, the kind of impact on the international organizations is to say, no, 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 there is no new money. We haven't got, you know, there isn't enough. It can't be done. It can't be done. We've all heard this before. Many things can be done. We just need people to try. The $10 billion fund is structured so that um, it's there to be able to reach the low and middle income countries. And this is why I think it's going to be interesting to some of the people in the room here today because those countries that are able to receive GB, G, uh, GPE financing, the partnership financing, as a low-income country, if your country starts to improve, if you're, if you're able, you know, the leadership country able to take a country to the point where you're able to do more, you lose that financing very quickly. And if you're not in crisis and you're not having an emergency, you can't access that funding. So for the countries that are doing quite well and, and have an opportunity, those are the countries that are poised, ready to be able to meet that education challenge and to, to have something that delivers education for all of their citizens, but exactly the moment where there isn't a funding support for it. So the, the central proposal of, the, of IFID is that lower and middle income countries are able to apply and that it exists as a resource where there's a combination. You know, if, if a, a country, any country says, right, we're eligible for IFID, how do we, we would like everyone to have a chance in our country to go to school. In simple terms, what do you do? The education ministry working with the finance ministry, working with the prime minister, president of the country, will have a, a political commitment to education for every child, will have a, a proposal. But the one thing they won't have is the funding for all of it. But the, the commitment that the country can make can be combined with the commitments that you can draw down. And if it provides an opportunity to provide <coughs> some grants, but also the op opportunity of interest-free loans, accessing impact bonds, accessing the guidance um, to be able to kind of knit all that together in a public policy for education. Coming up at the United Nations General Assembly meetings that maybe some of you will be attending at the end of September in New York, the Education Forum is meeting as one of the main uh, events uh, in the UN calendar, in the, in the UN headquarters. And at that moment, that pledging starts for that fund. There's already a number of um, commitments to it. Um, the beauty of it, um, for those that, that like the um, clever financing side, is that much of the fund can be built based on country guarantees. So if you can put in the grants of the first two billion, the next eight billion can very easily be leveraged. And so that next eight billion is all guaranteed by donor countries. And it means the donor countries can offer more because it's not just them committing to grants. Those can go to the other areas where they're traditionally spending um, and they're able to actually offer the guarantees. There's been a lot of goodwill where you have 
the big financing firms, Goldman Sachs, the uh, law firm Reed Smith, have been involved in, in contributing pro bono the legal work, the, um, the work on the donor guarantees to actually get all of that processed and ready. So the last two years, there's an enormous amount of work happening below the surface so that as this comes to the fore, it will actually be ready to move and provide that opportunity. And then I suppose what I would add to that is that financing doesn't exist in isolation, but the innovations around it, I think, are, are relevant for today. But also what exists out of it is that collaboration and partnership where countries are coming forward with their plans, um, that they're working out what their contribution is. Um, I'm also the chair of an organization called the Global Business Coalition for Education. And we've been working over the last 10 years on uh, working with the big multinational businesses and as corporate social responsibility and CSR becomes more sophisticated and becomes less about, uh, you know, investing in uh, different uh, non-profit and charitable causes and more about uh, how a business it, it works more effectively as a corporate citizen, there's an opportunity there for businesses where education is absolutely at the fore of what they need to invest in and support themselves. They'll need it for their own workforces, but also most of those businesses who have a product or service to sell need to know that middle classes are being created in countries around the world, otherwise they have no markets. So the investment in education is literally only a win-win for them. So the, com the companies that, that we're working with, but there are you know thousands of other companies around the world, but are looking at those opportunities for what they can do. So one of the key pieces they've been doing is um, creating something called the React database, React unit, where they plug in their availability, what they can offer, where they are in the world. And when something does unfold that's needed quickly, um, it's been done for emergencies so far, but there, people are able to put together their package but understand what a company can offer or is available to do locally. And the ambition is, as if it grows, that that React database will also be there for more than, well, I say more than just emergencies. If they're just emergencies, that would be great. But that there's an opportunity to develop it beyond emergencies and to have um, access to understanding um, who can do what, where, because other, otherwise there are two things that are very noticeably that happened. One is people don't know where to go to and who, who to call, so that sort of matchmaking that needs to happen in the system. And, and the other is the kind of inefficiency of it where there isn't really, uh, there's no, I've never seen an example where pro bono is just pro bono, where, oh, well, if this company can provide these services, somebody's got to do the cash bit. There's always a cash bit. So if you've already got a cash bit and are then adding in what the extra services are, then you can get that, um, that enhancement for it. Um, there's a um, huge conversations also going on with the teachers, the teachers' unions around the world, because obviously that we're, education is very reliant on the, the quality of, of teaching. And teachers I know are themselves looking at their own innovations and what they would bring to the classroom. And the Open University is at the forefront of leading those conversations, having pioneered from the early days ways to create mobile education, to be able to engage in lifelong learning, um, and to, to provide those opportunities. So I know there'll be a lot, lot more to come there. The thing I'd just like to finish with is actually on a personal note, is last week I w visited the Aegean Islands. We've been uh, able to raise the funding there for um, the children who are coming in as refugees onto those small Greek islands. And, you know, some of you remember the news story in 2015, 2016, where the, you know, what have traditionally been European holiday beaches, um, there were just boats arriving all the time with, at that time, mostly Syrian refugees. And it felt like a crisis that was very close to home for us here in Britain, for, for you know, for those around Europe. And um, it did galvanize a, a, a lot more awareness and a, and a lot more support at that time. But of course, crises come and go, they're in the news, they, they move on. And um, the anxiety that we all feel about, you know, refugees are on your beaches and then where are they going to live and where are they going to go? So obviously for the Greek government, they work very hard to host the, you know, the people that are there, for, but for a short period of time, believing of course that, it, that it's temporary. I went out to the islands last week because we realized that there were families there, children there, who were actually not just there for a few weeks. They were, you know, those visits, those stays in those camps while their papers are processed go on for months. And the, it, 
is important now to make sure that, sure that the schools have been set up, have sufficient funding, and um, are also able to grow. But what I found when I went out there was, yeah, the schools are there, and they're quite small, and they're catering for some of the children, not all. I hope that the new funding we brought in would allow that to, to grow. But actually, there were boats arriving all the time. And it, you know, there's Syrians, there's um, uh, Afghans coming from Iran because of the economic downturn. They're on the move. There are an awful lot of young people from, um, particularly young men, coming from uh, sub-Saharan Africa, obviously a large number from the Democratic Republic of Congo, but also, for, you know, you met young men from s so many other countries too. And their move is one where they're, um, you know, moving because there isn't enough for them at home. And I was struck by the fact that, first of all, there's new boats arriving. So you've got these small centres that are now crushed by the demand that's coming on them. And secondly, Talking to the young men in the camps, I arrived just after there'd been a protest, there'd been police that had gone in with tear gas. It just seemed very, very brutal and kind of there was a, quite a feverish atmosphere. But I was able to go into the camp afterwards, this is the one on, on Lesbos at Mario Camp, and talk to the young men. They have literally nothing to do. You know, these young men are, I mean, there was a group of them who were working out how to play a game using small rock because there's nothing to read, nothing to do. If they haven't had their phone charged, they haven't got the access on their phone. Th they, and I, there's a huge concern about the way we treat people where we are focused on girls and rightly so, but also these young men are fostering, you know, quite a lot of discontent. They're on the move because they're looking for a better life and they want to be able to do something. And I think that then the innovations that we now need to strive for is when we think of young people who are waiting, waiting for their future to start, waiting for an opportunity to break through, we need to have something we can take to them now and share with them now. And if people have low cost, simple ideas, I think being, having that opportunity to share that is, is um, where, you know, where we need to go. Um, one of the most significant, uh, and I'll finish with this, and if anyone's got me questions, I'm very happy to take questions, but one of the most significant reports that gives us a sense of where we are every year is UNESCO's Global Education Monitoring Report. And they, they're providing that update of, you know, we're coming up, you know, we're just about 10 years away from the deadline. But what they're showing is that the year that the generation of students that will finish secondary school now, this is the year that if students should, it will be, if we want every, sorry, I'm going to say that again, try and get this right. If we want every child to be finishing secondary school by 2030, this is the year where they all need to be going into school. And clearly that's not happening. In low-income countries, we've got 60% um, completing primary school. So you can see where that gap is. There isn't a way to say in 2030 that they'll have finished school if we aren't getting them school now. So we do need to galvanize ourselves and have ourselves go, go forward. Um, so we need to look at what that minimum proficiency is that we need for children and young people. So that when you see those young men in the camps or you see young people who you aren't doing anything, you know that that basic education is there and we're able to build on it with, with some of those skills for the future. So we do need to find ways to work together, ways that we're going to deliver education, ways that we can be smart about the financing coming through. And for those of you here that know how to contribute to building what that financing looks like, or want to engage in the plans for how it is implemented, both ends are equally important and valid at this time. So I hope this starts a conversation rather than kind of delivers all of the solutions, but I do congratulate you on the energy and commitment and focus you have here at the conference. Now, I had brought with me two films to show you, and I'm mindful that the um, first, uh, first film was really just talking about their world, and um, I can, um, well, if anyone looks up about their world, you'll be able to see it. But there's a very, very short film I would like to show you because it's part of a piece of work that's going off to the United Nations now. Because there is the big education forum, because there is the beginning of the IFID, we're also making sure that that awareness is there. So working with the Omnicom group of agencies, they've created the Right the Wrong campaign. And the right, you know, uh, we all get deluged with petitions to sign. But in my experience, where you've got a body of voices together, this is when politicians listen, you know, when they hear that we're all calling for the same thing. And the Right the Wrong campaign um, re really has been designed to address that. So the film that I wanted to show, if we can get it, 
is a, uh, just a very, very tiny short film um, that sets out the um, scope of the campaign. And then the un unveiling next week will be um, a big installation at the, at the UN and um, other aspects there. Can we show that film? Think about the things a child learns in school every day. The letters, numbers, reading, writing, science, technology, all the different ways we communicate. These are the building blocks of our future. But as of today, one in five children worldwide don't have these simple tools because world leaders have refused to fund their education. This means 260 million of our next generation won't be able to write new laws, discover cures, or find solutions to the problems that affect them. This is the global education crisis, an unjust crisis that forces girls and boys into extreme poverty, child labor, forced marriage, and violence. A crisis that doesn't just affect children, it affects us all. But what if you could be a part of the movement to end it? Let's give these girls and boys a fair chance to unleash their potential, a chance to change the world. Join the global movement by taking action at rightthewrong.org. Together, we can right the wrong. Great. So that's just a, um, that. That was just the very beginning thing. But at the United Nations next week, they've created a wonderful installation where you walk in. It looks like one chair in a classroom, and then with the mirrors, you realise there's just an endless goes off into infinity. They call it the infinity room of these endless empty chairs. And our goal, of course, is to is to fill them. But um, I th thank you very much for listening to me this morning.